Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, episode 63. My name, as always, is Dr. David C. Noe. It hasn't changed since last time. And I'm here in the vomitorium on an autumnal Saturday afternoon with my good friend and co-host, Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you, Jeff? I'm feeling good, although I would say it's more wintry than autumnal. Did you you would say wintry? Did you see that snow out there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's uh, Zeus is throwing snow cones all over the landscape. It's no good. It's no good. It's too early for me. It's snow good. That's it, right. It is snow good. But my boys are out there this morning. They made, uh, they made Before it melted, right. they made giant uh, snowballs, and they were all into it. They were excited. So. Yeah, yeah. My children wanted to do that to my child anyway. Yeah. So we could say... There's a kind of slush all over the world tonight. <laughs> there is, exactly. <laughs> but I'm feeling good. Yes. And I'm ready to dig into this very interesting topic we yeah, today. And today, today is your birthday. It is. I, I, I didn't want to say anything. Okay, but, but I had to. Okay, yes. So Mishka can insert a little birthday music here for our fabulous co-host. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Right. It will not be my birthday when this airs. No, but, no. But... but uh, I mean, this is this is how low it's gotten. That what am I doing? My birthday, I'm recording this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Felicissimum Natale. Happy uh, birthday! Good Happiest good of birthdays. Yes. So we got a shout out. We do. Yes, and uh, let me get this one started. This goes to a Mr. George R. McClarty. New York City, born and raised. And he says, I'd like a shout out and something to be read. This is new. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's he's uh, blazing a new path. He mm-hmm. says, why the classics? Because it appeals to that secret depth of the human soul where shadows of other worlds and other lives pass like the shadows of nameless and soundless ships. Did, no, did George write that? I don't think so. He said borrowed from oh. Vladimir and Nabokov. Okay, all right, all right. And he says... And uh, he says, our muses are perished, withered are our laurels, ruined is our Parnassus. The woods are all become mute. The valleys and mountains for sorrow are grown deaf. Nymphs or satyrs are found no more among the woods. The shepherds have lost their song. Which is from Jacobo Sanazzano, the epilogue to Arcadia. Okay. That's very that's very sad. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And we have to thank George because he did some of the show prep this week. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, here you go. Read this. Right. There's a show. That's a show. We could just end it right here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm taking that he, he sees our podcast perhaps as, as a an answer to this 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 this, kind of this dirge here, right? Um, yeah, something along those lines. To awaken the woods once again. Right. What what's less than an answer? What's not as um definitive or impressive as an answer a whimper maybe a whimper this is a whimper in response a whimper a whimpering response yes right. okay instead okay. of the curse instead of cursing the darkness by some matches yes. i think that's the it phrase it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness right, right. Yeah. so that's what we're doing i yeah. guess the cursing of the darkness comes after the break <laughs> that's right segment <laughs> two or three yes all right <laughs> So, Jeff, what are we giving the listener today? Well, apparently we are going to teach people or show people how to be a Latin guru. Yes, I think so. Yeah. You think this is doable? I don't know. Okay. In one hour? Probably not. Probably not. But we'd like to trace out some of the steps that they could take to go from uh, a grammatical knowledge and only grammatical or deductive knowledge of the language to a more active knowledge Mm -hmm. and a more useful knowledge, you might say. Sounds great. Yeah. Now, I don't uh, bill myself as a guru or uh, Svenjali, I think it's pronounced. Svenjali. Svenjali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm more of a Sven irascible, you might say. That's right, exactly. Uh, yeah. But I have learned some things over the years. Yes, you have. I and, can attest uh, to that. Right. Yep. And uh, I've been blessed to know some of the best Latin speakers in the world, either as close friends or at least acquaintances. And uh, so we want to just lay out for the audience how you can take your Latin study to the next level. Yeah. And as a Latinist yourself, Jeff, Mm -hmm. along the way, we're going to see some of the things that have worked for you, some of your own memories and experiences about your engagement with this incredible language. Right. And um, I would say that my knowledge of Latin, the way that I've taught Latin, has been almost exclusively uh, grammatical okay. and and uh, from reading right and I've participated in some stuff with you with the, right. with, the with the spoken Latin but it's it's really something that I've never really picked your brain about mm-hmm. and so I'm eager to get to it I hope you brought some gloves <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't get messy oh it's gonna be a mess <laughs> absolutely uh, so we got an opening quote mm-hmm. right we got an opening quote and this comes from uh, a book that was written in 2001 if I'm not mistaken Ni Falor 
by uh, someone named Francois Waquet. It's called Latin or the Empire of a Sign from the 16th to the 20th centuries. And uh, Jeff, you're going to read us a quote from that, right? It's a, quite a lengthy quote, but it's mm-hmm. just packed with interesting material. Yeah, here we go. Catholic or Protestant, 17th century schoolboys throughout Europe all did Latin. And so, of course, did their Orthodox contemporaries. In Peter the Great's Russia, there appeared schools copied from the Jesuit colleges, like the one in Kiev, which offered a classical curriculum. The academy in Moscow was reformed following the same model at the beginning of the 18th century, when schools like those at Chernigov in the Ukraine, Rostov and Nov... Sorry. That's a tough one. I, was, I wasn't prepared for all this Russian. <laughs> Novgorod. Novgorod were also established. By 1750, there were 26 colleges in the Russian Empire offering an education based on a Latin curriculum. Latin was not only the daily bread of collegians in Europe, but in the New World as well. The school system established in the American colonies was modeled on what was done in England. The first transatlantic secondary school to be founded, the Boston Latin School, derived its pedagogic approach from the English grammar schools and ancient languages, Latin to the fore. Formed the, it formed the essence of the education given there. Right. All, so let, yeah, we please. can just pause there yeah. and interact with that a little bit. It's surprising, surprising how successful and popular Latin was in uh, Russia. That, right? That's brand new to right. me. Yeah. Right. That's crazy. Yep. So maybe if we have any listeners in Kiev or Novgorod, Rostov, these places. I've never been to Russia. Have you? I have not. I would really, really like to visit. That would be fascinating. Yes. Right? A great fan of uh, Russian literature, which I can only read in English translation. Right. But they were studying Latin. And the first school, of course, here in uh, the New World, as Waquette calls it, was the Boston Latin School, which is probably still in existence. Yeah, I and, would imagine and so. And hopefully still teaches Latin. Have you read this book, by the way? I have. Yeah. Cover to cover. I mean, just this quote, I, it, it sounds fascinating. I loved it. Absorbed every word. Now, since that time, I have spoken to some other uh, students of the history of the Latin language. They have a lot to criticize about this book. Mm. Says that it is. Uh, they say that it is... Uh, a guilty of some severe misunderstandings in places, a misreading of the evidence and so forth. Mm. I don't really feel uh, adequate to judge on that. I okay. haven't done the research myself. We should maybe devote a future episode just to the book. But uh, for me, I learned a tremendous amount from it. One of the little anecdotes before uh, you continue on to this great quote is that in some places where speaking in Latin, speaking in Latin was uh, obligatory for the students of the schools if you spoke a word of the vulgar tongue while you were there, you had to put on a hat that was shaped like a donkey, and you had to wear it around for the rest of the day. Really? You were the designated asinus. My God. So that's even worse than the dunce cap sitting in the corner. Oh, it's much worse. You had to wear it around. You had to wear it around <laughs> the whole day. <laughs> you had to peer out from donkey eyes because you had transgressed. You were speaking a vulgar tongue, not Latin. Wow. Now, you know, shame is probably not a very compassionate motivation, let's right. just be honest. <laughs> but it can be very effective, hmm. and in some cases it was. You've never gone to those links, though, in your own classroom. Though, I have the, not. The I have been head. tempted. I've told the story, <laughs> uh, but I've never done it. So. Yeah. All right, let me pick it up. Um, all these children who started on Latin very young, sometimes even when learning to read, had to absorb and churn out truly stupefying volumes of Latin over the period of their schooling. And the task was every bit as grueling in the English grammar schools as in the Jesuit colleges of Catholic Europe. Sir Simon de Wees claimed that a pupil at Bury St. Edmunds in the early 17th century, uh, he had composed more than 2,800 Latin and Greek verses. William Lilly recalled that as a schoolboy in Ashby de la Zouche, he could make extempora verses on any theme, all kinds of verses, hexameter, pentameter, plalukiacs, iambics, sapphics, etc. A century later, a Turin youth called Vittorio Alfieri comp- competed with a college friend in the recitation of Latin verses. To his great shame, he was regularly beaten by his rival, who could recite up to 600 lines of Virgil's Georgics at a time without getting a syllable wrong. While I couldn't even do 400... And not as well either. Oh, what a loser. What a loser. Only not, 400? Not even 400 lines. Uh, crested uh, around 370 and that's it? That's it. Exactly. Get this guy fitted for a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know <laughs> the first couple lines of the first Georgic, Tictera tu patilai recaban sub tegmina fagi. Uh, that's about it. Yeah. And that's not even a Georgic. No. <laughs> actually, that's an eclog. No. I, yeah. That's an eclog. All the elements of memorization that were part of my, mm-hmm. my schooling in Latin and Greek, I have almost permanently flushed from memory. Uh, why did you do that, Winkle? I, I don't know. It just, it just happened. Yes, it happens, right. 
So we're going just... to talk later uh, a little bit about the value of memorization when it comes to appropriating Latin. Yeah. And uh, talk a little bit about that. But it's difficult for sure. Right. Uh, just a little bit more here. Many other performances with numbers of this sort could be quoted, but they would no more be no more eloquent than the astonished uh, reaction of little John Waldegrave, age seven, on his arrival at Eton. He judged it a very odd place, full of boys and Latin. Yeah. <laughs> Poor little John Waldegrave. <laughs> oh, Drop him off at Eton, right? right. Uh, his you know, mom pushes him out of the carriage, right? Here's your bologna sandwich. Run in there and start to study. And he says... Uh, so odd, full of boys and Latin. And Latin that's it. Everywhere. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So we're going to talk today, uh, for the listeners' sake, about some ways to develop a quotidian, that is a daily, a quotidian Latin vocabulary. So we're going to talk about my experience uh, moving from the, you know, the grammatical-based knowledge to hopefully a more active, and uh, trying to learn how to speak Latin, share some tips about the joys and the pitfalls. And Jeff, we're going to rely a little bit later in the episode on uh, the duck book, right? The duck book, yes. The first thousand words in Latin, right? Right. right. And uh, this is written by uh, Heather Amory uh, with illustrations by Stephen Cartwright. Now, as an illustrator yourself, mm -hmm. uh, the listener may not know this, but Dr. Winkle in a previous life was a syndicated cartoonist. Well... Yes, I you mean, were syndicated very, very briefly. What what counts as syndication? Well, in more than one newspaper at the same time, I suppose. Right? right? It was kind of a uh, trial deal, briefly syndicated. It was an online thing. So it, anybody conjuring up images of like Calvin and Hobbes in their heads, nothing like that. So right? who were your characters, though? Um, my my character. Don't don't get all uh, <laughs> humble braggy now. My, my character. My character. Okay. Was a um, was a kind of an advice columnist by the name of Ed Fargle. Ed Fargle. Yes, and he, right. he answered questions that people had sent in, but he ad answered them in the most absurd and unhelpful fashion. Okay. Right. Do you have an example? Um, not off the top of my okay. head. If you went through, if you dug, if the listener wants to dig through some like dusty internet archives, you could probably right. find them out. There. F A R G L E. Yes. Okay. Right. Ed Fargle, and people would ask him questions. Yes. And he would give really bad, bad answers, answers. And then bad I, advice. And then I would illustrate as the cartoon right, right. Uh, something to kind of extend the joke. Right. Yep. So as an experienced, syndicated uh, cartoonist like yourself, what do you think of Cartwright's illustrations for this book, First Thousand Words in Latin? Um, and what they actually reminded me a lot of uh, is of Richard Scarry. Did you, oh, did you yeah, grow up the with the great big schoolhouse? Yeah. I, you know. Cars and trucks and things that go. Yes. That kind of stuff. And there's a worm. What's his name? Lowly worm. Lowly. Yeah. Right. And it, but it's a similar kind Can of. Can you tell by the tone of my voice? Yeah. You, you didn't, not all that impressed. You didn't like it? I, okay. I like the illustrations, but what I find in so many children's books, no Plot. Right. There, no there, plot. There was no plot in Richard Scarry. There yeah. was, I mean, a lot of things happening in busy right. town. Right. As the name implies. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it's a similar kind of conceit, whereas in this book, you know, you look for the duck, right? Okay. The hidden duck. You had to look for gold bug in Richard Scarry. Oh, really? Yes. He's hidden on every page. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Maybe, but, maybe knowing about gold bug now, mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that some kind of a medicated foot powder? <laughs> Right. If you, that may prevents it, chafing. Okay. Yeah. That may improve my appreciation of Richard Scarry. It had nothing to do with foot powder. If, if you're basing your judgment on that. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't really get into that too much. Yeah. My another, boys loved him. Another one I hate while we're on the topic is um, Curious George. Oh uh, yeah. Exactly. The curious thing about that is where's the story? Right? Where, where's the story? And where's and every story is the same. You, right. Uh, curious George. Screws something up, right? Um, and then something else is to come in to make it right, and then right. everybody's happy with George for fixing his own mistake, kind right? Of, right. Yeah. If as though that constitutes a plot, <laughs> right? right? Uh, just a stream of consciousness, monkey. Right? Yeah, I, I don't mind the drawings once again. Yeah, but it's okay. Where's the story? Right, the story. So yeah. the, this uh, this book, you, you say, this first thousand words. How could that have a story? Well, that, it doesn't have a story, but yeah. see, I'm so interested in it because I want to appropriate. And, you know, stuff into my mind yeah. all these thousand words. Gotcha. So uh, Heather Amory, the um, the editor, uh, Stephen Cartwright, the illustrator, and uh, our friend Patrick Owens was the Latin consultant. Well, he was. Yes. And okay. uh, spent a great deal of time on this book, uh, hammering out, narrowing down, finding with great specificity the accuracy of each one of these offerings to the reader. That's excellent. Now, you may have already said it. When did this book come out? I don't know. Let me check here. Shuffle some papers around so the listener thinks we're doing something 
worthwhile. Uh huh. Buying time. Yeah. Buying time. 2014. Okay. Well, so fairly recent. Uh, yeah. Based on a previous title, first published in 1979, it's by Osborne. Okay. Uh, which is in London, not far from Eden. Eton, I think, where poor little John Waldegrave found all those boys and all that Latin dropped off. <laughs> Right. So let's get right into it. Let's then. do it. Yeah. Do you want to start you want to start talking about your own journey in Latin, kind of how you how you got into it, how you started learning and and what your uh, kind of your experience was? Right. Sure. So we can uh, put this all into the Wayback Machine yep. and take us back to uh 1993. Okay. Wow. So I almost was, almost 30 years ago. Now. Yeah, I was 20 years old then, right? I was 20 years old then, uh, so the reader can do some math if they want to. You, you knew, the um, did I say reader? Listener, sorry. Yeah. The listener knew we were a couple of old guys all along, right? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> so they can, they can do some math here. Sure. Right. 1993, and uh, I had been taking Greek for a little while now, about a year and a half. And Ken Bratt, who was on this show before, yeah. uh, for the, um, the Philippi archaeology episode, he said, you know, David, you should, um, you should add some Latin to your study of Greek. Okay, I guess you seem like you know what you're doing. Um, maybe I've told the story on air before. Uh, so I picked up Latin, and uh, for one summer, I went through Wheelock. I don't know, it was the fifth edition, maybe the fourth edition, mm-hmm. and I just poured through it all summer. I was I was working manual labor during the day, you know, full day of hard labor, and then in the evening, I had a kind of a literary retirement, and uh, I really credit it to God's providence that I was able to have the most productive summer of my life, probably, uh, because I, I did all of Wheelock in that three-and-a-half-month you know, uh, space. Wow. And, uh, it really, um, it really stuck. So I had a tutor, uh, a fellow named John Bergsma. He came by every Wednesday evening and would answer questions that had arisen. Uh, but the other thing that helped was, uh, our former professor, Dr. Rich Weavers mm-hmm. had written this program. I think that you must've used it also. Uh, I think it came with quizzes that you could take uh, Correct. on the computer. This, I mean, this is before online anything. Oh, right? yes. I think these were five and a quarters. Yeah. Maybe three and a half inch floppies, but almost certainly they were five and a quarter floppies. Yeah. Right? They were huge. You could serve, you could serve <laughs> food on them. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'd set my coffee cup on one of those by uh, on accident, you know. <laughs> so you slip one of those in there and then it just scrolls on the screen. No graphics whatsoever. No. Just all text. All text. Yeah. But he had used COBOL, uh, which I had to do some research here. The Common Business-Oriented Language is what COBOL stands for. <laughs> I've, ne- I've never heard of that before. You've never heard of the COBOL language? No. Oh, yeah. It was I, big. Really? Replaced punch cards. Okay. Yeah. Then Maybe that, it ran on punch cards. But this I don't has, know. Certain, has since been replaced by many other... Oh, C++ and Java and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, know I don't, about that I don't stuff. even know. Yeah. Python and Piglet. There's probably not a Piglet programming language, <laughs> but there ought to be. Uh, COBOL, okay. Common Business-Oriented Language. And he had basically inputted all the paradigms that you can find at the uh, front of Wheelock and in Gildersleeve's Latin. And I went through thousands, tens of thousands of iterations, you know, of learning do das dat, dam das dat is dat, kiwis, kiwis, kiwi, kiwim, kiwe, and so forth. Right. Mara, maris, etc. And just tens of thousands of iterations. So by the end of the summer, just because of this kind of brute effort, I had a pretty comprehensive knowledge of the forms of the language. And then did you, then and, uh, just um, in terms of the classes that you took, right. did you do test in to like a higher level? Or? I did. Okay. I did. And looking back, the tests were easier than, if if Ken Bratt's listening, <laughs> maybe turn this part off. The tests were easier than the kind I give now. I give more demanding tests than the ones I took then. Yeah. But I scored really high. Okay. Like a 98 and a 99. Oh, wow. And I had never done that well on anything. You okay. Know, I was a strong B plus student in everything. It wasn't hard for me to do pretty well. That was, So that must have been a huge confidence boost. Tremendous. Right. right. I think I grew three inches that summer after I took that test. Because here I had done really well on something that was brand new. Yeah. It was a huge confidence booster. Now, in relation to your learning, uh, you started with Greek. Right. Um, the, the When you were a freshman or a sophomore or, or what? Right. Did... I came in the middle of the year, in the spring of 91. Okay. In the You you were still kicking around Calvin. Though, I was. You're, uh, today's your birthday. You're a little superannuated, but you were still there. I was. Yeah. And so then the fall of 90. Two is when I started Greek. So I had done okay. about two, two and a half semesters of Greek okay. before starting in on Latin. Gotcha. So same kind of thing, though, right? Uh, B plus and then started studying classical languages. Suddenly I'm motivated. I start doing well. Yeah. Right? And great teachers, of course. I, I mean, I don't deserve really any credit for this, but um, it was it was wonderful. And yeah. I, I just took to the Latin. Then I got dropped into a Virgil class. I got dropped into, 
you know, medieval Latin, those kinds of things. Right, 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 right. Now, Dave, you mentioned some of the texts that you that you read, and we right. share them in common, like um, uh, the Far Virgil. I remember that, yes. one, or, or others. I mean, were there ones that you remember saying, "Ah, I, this was really helpful. I like this," or "I didn't right. like it." I liked the Far Virgil, although now in in hindsight, once again, I think it's too helpful. There's it, too much on the page. It glosses almost every word, and you know, it was a great benefit to me. And apparently, there's some kind of a syndrome. My son was telling me about this a while ago. I can't remember the name of it. But it's the syndrome whereby once you become an expert in something, you go really deep on something that's very small. Mm -hmm. You forget what it was like not to know very much about it. That's very true. So you accidentally uh, exaggerate other people's ability to approach it. Yes. So that could be happening with me a little bit. Yes. In other words, I think that that far page is stuffed with information too much. Let Virgil speak for himself. Right, 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 right. But, But it's only after all of that study that maybe I can see it. You yeah, know? exactly. I remember really liking that text as well, um, in particular the, the, the purple hardcover yes. uh, that I really enjoyed. I like enjoyed. that too. And I like <laughs> the fact that it was cloth. Yeah. It seemed like a valuable book. I did. I, do you still have yours? Somewhere. Sorry, I got my... It got pretty beaten up. Yeah. Yes, I think right now I would, I would agree with you too much on the page right. there, but it did, it allowed me to really focus more on Kind of the uh, the music of the language. You're right, and and not so much manic flipping. Correct to the back or in a dictionary. Right, and so I I liked that. And, I did too. And it gave I, some speed, some rapidity to the work. Right, and I think it's one of the reasons that I I still love Virgil. Oh yeah, yeah. How can you not love Virgil, frankly? Yeah. But another really memorable event in my acquisition of Latin was that we were reading a, a survey course. This was um, a second. Well, it would have been a second year course. It was my. I think it was my first actual semester in a classroom, you know, after the independent study. Yeah. But it was uh, Selections from Roman History. I, I can't remember the author of the book. Uh, I can remember the color. It was gray. Do you remember this with one? The, with the red writing. The I, red letters yes. on the front. And they were in a kind of Trajan inscription sort of font. Oh, yes. I, I can see it, but, yes. but I couldn't tell you the author. Right. right. And the really nice thing about it is that unlike the far text, I don't think there were any helps on the page. There were some in the back, and then George Harris, whom we've talked about before, Mm -hmm. uh, of blessed memory, Beate Memoriae, was a booming voice. Yeah. And an Ontario hockey player, farm boy, (laughs) really incredible guy. Yeah. He would add in and provide all of the missing material. That's right. That's right. Yep. I I took that same class. Right. Yep. And so I was prepping something, which uh, until just last night, when prepping this episode, I thought was from the historian Livy. So I've kept this phrase in my memory since 1993, fall of 93, and it is the ablative absolute orta seditione. Hmm. So orta seditione. So seditio is, as the English derivative implies, sedition, mutiny, disagreement. And orta is from ori or oriri, to rise up. So a sedition having arisen. Yes, Yes, that's right. So when mutiny broke out, something like that. Right. And I was prepping for this test, and I was prepping all night, and I had learned it really, really well. And I went in the next day for the test, and as often happens with Latin teachers, you assign, say, 30 items, but then you only test on 10. Yeah. So the idea is the student needs to learn all of it, but then you don't actually test them on all of it because it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so we got to the part of the the phrase, which I have since learned, is not Livy at all. It's Tacitus, uh, Annales. Book 12, section 54, if you're interested. And uh, this phrase, orta seditiona, was left off the test because it was one of the parts removed. And I remembered it. So I actually wrote it in on the test. You hoping for some extra credit? (laughs) Yeah, wrote it in on the test (laughs) and translated it. And then later, Dr. Harris said, you know, why did you put that in there? And I said, well, because I remembered it and I didn't want it to go to waste. A, A small victory but for me, really meaningful. Yeah, so, and when, when you explained that to, to, to George Harris, did he kind of you know, tip the cap and say, well uh, done, sir? No, I think he gave me one of his gentlemanly <laughs> harumphs. <laughs> I remember them well. Yeah. A very, a very lovely man, yeah. good-natured. But, you know, he had seen a couple thousand undergrads by that point. I was not going to impress him with that. But, gotcha, yeah. Uh, and I wasn't really trying to, maybe a little. But, but the fact that you remember yes, it. Uh, it was a sweet victory. Yeah. And that is such a motivator when it comes to more study. Without a doubt. Right. I can do this. Mm-hmm. So then I went on, and uh, we were talking a little bit before the episode, reading uh, Primer of Medieval Latin. Yes. You remember that one? I it's remember a, not liking it. Yeah, I didn't like it much either. Yeah. In part because you spend so much time with COBOL learning all the forms, 
And then you find out the venerable Bede, <laughs> eh, he's got some corners on the grammar. Right. So. He's quasi venerable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the opposite of venerable is. Devenerable? Devenerable. I don't yeah. think so. An anthology of prose and verse. So this is by Charles Beeson, still in print. But I think uh, I still have my blue hardcover, um, hardback version of that. I got the orange paperbacks. It's uh, just a very unattractive book. Makes it worse. Yeah. Interesting how the color and the aesthetics of books uh, shade our uh, perception. I judge books by their covers I do. all the time. Yeah. Right. It's too early for the hack it ad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the really memorable parts of that book that I absolutely loved was a poem, which is O Sacred Head, uh, translated O Sacred Head, now wounded by Bernard of Clairvaux, right? Yeah. Whose dates I just happened to know because I was teaching on him this week, 1090 to 1153. Okay. So the end of the 10th, uh, 11th century, beginning of the 12th. Mm. And at the same time as I was reading this medieval Latin, I was reading Calvin's Institutes in English. And Calvin quotes Bernard more than any other father except Augustine. Is that right? Yes. A great admirer of Bernard or Bernard, maybe. Yeah. Someone's going someone's gonna to send us an email, no doubt. <laughs> uh, who's that guy down in Australia? Oh, uh, Ron. It could be Ron. Ron. He doesn't. He doesn't like the way we we pronounce things. Or yeah, it's he, Brisbane. He said Brisbane. Yes, he, he gently corrects. Ask our, him. Uh, yeah, ge- our ignorance. Right. Yeah. A, a very generous fellow. Yes. But in any event, Bernard, maybe if you're listening, Ron. Mm-hmm. We're not going to make Ron into a running gag, are we? <laughs> no. Unless Poor he, Ron. Unless he wants to be. <laughs> and uh, so Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, very much admired by both Calvin and Luther. And so I thought, wow, this is interesting poetry, right? So it goes like this. Salve caput cruentatum, totum spinis cordronatum, conquisatum, vulneratum, ardrundina sic verberatum, facies putis ilita. Salve quies dulcus vultus, immutatis et in cultus, immutavit suum florem, totus versus in palordrem, quem coili tremit cura. It's got a kind of a Dr. Seuss rhythm. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. And one of the reasons I was fascinated by this was I liked rhyming a lot before I encountered Greek and Latin, Hmm. right? The rhyming of children's books, the rhyming of pop songs, other kinds of things. I loved rhyming. Um, But then I learned uh, classical Latin doesn't rhyme. No. Classical Greek doesn't rhyme. I remember on a, a grad school exam. Right. <laughs> did, I, did I tell this story already? I don't think so, but oh, tell it again. Yes, I, I remember that um, there was a question about a couple of lines of poetry. Right. I don't even remember who the classical author was, and I had nothing. You did tell this before, but uh, tell it again because okay, so, it's lovely. So I had I had nothing, and so I felt i got to write something down. Right? <laughs> so I should have just wrote down Orta Seditione. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wrote that... Uh, the, the, the the lines were important because they happened to rhyme, oh. right? And he got back and said, <laughs> you no. You got a snarky says, comment. There's, yeah, it's just, there's, there's no rhyming in, yeah. in in classical Latin. That's true. But, there is internal rhyme. You know, there's rhyme within a line. I should have conjured up a an example. Maybe after the break we'll give an example of internal rhyme, mm-hmm. but never at the end of the at line. At the end of the line. Like, no. a, like, a, there's no, like a pop song. You don't, you right. don't see that, right? No. Uh, but I thought... You know, this is good. It's easy to memorize, and it's really good Latin. It's beautiful. It's, yeah. you know, hail the head that's wounded, all crowned with thorns, beaten, wounded, uh, whipped with reeds, arunda nesiquer baratum, the face, facius putis ilita. Uh, so Bernard, beautiful. And that has stuck. Snippets of that have stuck since uh, 1994, I think. Yeah. And that's just because um, when you're learning something in another language, now the listener may dispute this, the older I get, I find the easier it is to memorize Latin than to remember English things because the unfamiliarity of it, hmm. right? We get so much English, if you're an English speaker, whatever your native language is, you get so much of that. Something in another language has an unfamiliarity to it, so it's tacky, it sticks. Interesting, So yeah. it may be a little harder to get in. Uh, but once you get it in, it's there with a kind of permanence. That's interesting. I think that goes against what I think most conventional wisdom would say. You know, the older you get, um, right? You, you learning a, a new language is uh, forget about it. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't think that's right. That's int- that's really interesting. I don't I like think that. that's right. Yeah. So then we move on to grad school. But first, Jeff, yes. let's hear a little bit about uh, your experience. You started Latin yes. a lot earlier than I did. It did. I, I did. I started, yeah, we, it was offered in my high school, okay. uh, where it is no longer offered at my at my high school. So this is the Cursing the Darkness. This is the bit of the Cursing of the Darkness. Okay. It, it, the program there died with my, mm. when my Latin teacher retired. Mm. Um, but uh, I had a great teacher. His name was Chuck Ostindi. He loved Latin. 
Um, and now, now you know that I'm thinking about it, he 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 incorporated a lot of spoken Latin. Right. I mean, he didn't teach us that way, but right. I mean, he he brought that element in. Mm-hmm. Um, but I took Latin. It, it, we, it was only um, I'm trying to think. It was only it was offered for two years, and so I took it as a junior and a senior in high school mm-hmm. with Dan Vutberg. With Dan Vutberg, mm-hmm. exactly a, a recent shout out, right? Um, and I mean the other offerings. I mean, you could take at my high school. You take Spanish, of course. They had French and German, and then also Latin. And the reason I took Latin was really because my parents really pushed me to take. Okay, it. they had taken it um, in the in high school and, and in college. They drilled into me kind of its its mm. kind of its practicality in terms of. Uh, vocabulary, right. and and also kind of its link to the ancient world, which they knew that I was interested in, uh, in, uh, already by that time. And so I said, I kind of said, eh, I'm, I'm an easygoing guy. I said, yeah, sure, why not? Right. The other languages didn't really interest me. Like my response to Kim Bratt, right? Yeah. Hey, take Latin. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, I'll do it. And so, yeah, um, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, and it wasn't, you know, sometimes you'll hear about Latin programs in high school being Eighty percent toga parties and twenty percent right. language. It was not. It yeah, was. Yeah, I, I got an go finish that thought, but yeah. I got an anecdote on that. So, no, I, just to say that um, my teacher, Mr. Ostindi, he really, um, he really drilled, drilled the grammar, mm-hmm. and um, I felt like I would, I, I learned Latin very well in those two years. And what kinds of things did you read before my anecdote? Um, you know, I was, I think we did. It was not Eka Romani, okay, but it was a it was a text very much like that. Right, I just remember it was filled with lots of of you know semi disturbing off putting pictures, <laughs> right? Um, Richard Scary kind it of. It was kind of Richard Scary. Um, so I don't I don't remember the the text that we used. Mm. I remember the class time being a, a balancing between reading the grammar, um, studying the grammar, and linking it to something um, cultural from right. antiquity, and that's what I loved. He, and, it, right. and it wasn't just okay, we're doing this. Part A and L, part B, something different. He always made it connect to, yes. you know, even if the sentence was, "Your dog is is wandering about." Canis tuus erdrat. Right. Very good. Right. Okay. And then, so and I remember the 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 lesson where we were learning the word for dog. Right. And we got the famous Kawi Kanem from, yeah, from Pompeii. Right. Right. And so it was great stuff like that, and I I loved it. Yep. Which reminds me of the Far Side cartoon, you know, with the guys crouched behind the. Tree and there's the front door, you know. Yeah. And there's a beware of Doug beware sign. Of Doug. It's one of my favorites. It's genius. <laughs> it is genius. Brilliant. <laughs> Sounds like a good teacher. He was you a very had. good teacher. What was his name again? Chuck Ostindi. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That that's good teaching. Is what that is. I would say. Yep. Now the anecdote. Now this is not personal, but it's something I read. It's uh, it's got to be a kind of a whopper, and that is um. Many of the schools, you talk about grammar instruction, language, but 70% toga parties and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, the Latin word for a cudgel, right, a, a knobbed stick, yes. is fustus. Fustus. F-U-S-T-I-S, fustus. That's one of the words you can use for something with which to beat a person. Baculum is another one, mm-hmm. right? So you want to put together, you know, a society of uh, young Latin students. One particularly notorious high school had the fustus latina. <laughs> <laughs> the cudgel, the of, Latin the, club. The, 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 <laughs> that's one of those instances in which you got to read down a little further in the dictionary entry. Right, right. Because it's a uh, it's equivocation. Do we have Do we have time for another quick answer along those same lines? Yeah, let's hear it. So back in the day, this has got to be about ten years ago when I was still teaching Latin. Uh, I gave my students an optional extra credit assignment. It was like hmm. a last day of the semester kind of fun thing. You're a generous fellow. Yes. Part and, of Fustus Latina. And what they could do is that I said you had to translate a, a pop song into right. Latin and then you know, turn it in as, as a text. But to get the extra credit, you had to perform it. Oh. Right? And so not a lot of people went for it. Was, you, was this the origin of Walk This Way by Aerosmith? It might be. Because you sent me that one time. Exactly. I translated it into, into, actually into the dactylic hexameter. Mm. So, uh, maybe we should read that sometime. <laughs> so a few kids did it. And I remember one of my students wanted to do um, Elton John's Rocket Man. Ah. Right? And so what he did... Not really realizing that there's probably not an ancient Latin word for a rocket. No, not an ancient Latin right, word. Right. But he um, he didn't search for like a Neo-Latin. He went to, are you familiar with William Whitaker's words? Yes, I am. So uh, a search engine by which you can search for words you know, from English to Latin or from Latin to English. And he typed into English to Latin. He typed in the word rocket. <laughs> and what he got was a, I believe it was rucetta uh, as a, a first declension noun. Huh. Uh, R-U-C-H-E-T-T-A. Okay. Which translated to rocket. Not realizing that rocket... Oh, it's a vegetable. It's arugula. <laughs> so he came in and he uh, sang and performed 
uh, Weir Ruketai. <laughs> the man was, he thought it was with a, the man of a rocket, uh, and it was Arugula Man. Oh, that's and terrible! It, it was it, it no, it, it wasn't. It was awesome. It was fa- it was fabulous. <laughs> you liked it? I did. I enjoyed it very very much. Hmm. Yep. But so, uh, but exactly, he should uh, again. He, he, uh, he should have dug a little deeper. Hmm. So I'm I'm on pages twenty and twenty one of our book, right? The first thousand words of Latin. Yeah. The, the Amory book. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the heading is the category. The genus is itinera. Ah. Right. Journeys, and I'm looking at uh, orbitae, which are train tracks. Curris tractorius, a train. I'm looking at gubernator, the conductor. Ha maxosticus mercatus, which mm. is a freight train. A helicopterum, which you can guess what that means, right? But I am not finding rocket. Probably because it's not just a general way of that most people travel, perhaps. Maybe that's why yeah. it's not in the category so, of yeah. uh, Jeff Bezos and William Shatner, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Notwithstanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Machina mentum, machina mentum, an engine. Lots nice. of good words in there. Nice. That's nice. a great that's a great anecdote. Arugula man. <laughs> Arugula man. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Well, I think we should leave it there for now and uh, pay the bills. Sounds good. This episode is brought to you by Hackett Publishing. The good people at Hackett have been supporting this podcast for more than a year now with generosity and verve. They have offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Indianapolis, Indiana, and have been providing fine quality translations of the classics and a variety of other fields to you, the reader, for more than 20 years. Jeff, what are some of the things that you like about Hackett? I like uh, how accessible their translations are. I like how affordable their translations are. I've used them in class. I They are one of the, the few go-to places where I know that the translation is going to thread that needle between being um, readable, but also very close to the original language. Uh, I look their their catalog is huge. Right, you can find all kinds of interesting stuff there, not just in the classics, but no, in, in all, all corners of the humanities. Right, so we have a pretty narrow expertise, right, mm-hmm. in the classics. We try to go deep in that, but there's a whole world out there of interesting things to read. Yeah, Hackett. I'm looking at their website now. They have a, a new resource on Muslim sources of the Crusader period. So I got a question this week from a former student who was asking me about uh, some of the Muslim influences on Thomas Aquinas hmm. and uh, the authors who you know were uh, translating and interpreting uh, Aristotle, the Arabic authors, right. who brought back some of this material. The Crusaders brought it back from the East. And uh, so here's maybe a perfect book to answer some of those questions. Uh, you know, what were the Muslim sources during that time period? And what kind of access did they have to the Greek manuscripts, among other things? Right. That title alone just r- reminds me of how much I simply do not know. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, me too. But also just the breadth of what uh, Hackett has available. Yeah. Uh, another title I'm looking at here is The Rise of the Mongols, Five Chinese Sources. Now, the Mongols did have some interaction with the Roman world at some point. Uh, but, you know, there's just so much to learn. And... Uh, you go to hackettpublishing.com like mm-hmm. a kid in a candy store. That's right. So, you, uh, so listeners, uh, go to that website, pick out the text you like, and uh, when you're ready to buy your text, you type in AN2021 right. in the coupon code box. That's and, your coupon code. And mm-hmm. speaking of kid in the candy store, mm-hmm. right, when you go to Hackett Publishing to pick up your sources, mm-hmm. you're looking around for the candy corns, right? Can- I hate candy corn. What are you talking about? <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> So you get the ones that you want. Yes. No, no right. candy corn. Right. Like everybody's Bacchae with the Elvis cover that you like so oh, I much. I love it. Yep. And you drop that in your grocery basket. Yep. And uh, AN2021 at the checkout. This episode of Ad Nauseam also brought to you by the Moss Method. Uh, I'm here with a man who can tell us all about what that is, Dave. Right. Like no one else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so the Moss Method is a program that I have developed for learning Greek. It can take you from a neophyte, little or no knowledge of the language, to erudite in a short amount of time. Sounds great. Now, how, how, how does that happen? Well, I have developed a program whereby you get in four modules, right? Each of four modules, more than 40 video lessons where I explain every word, every phrase, every ending, every form of these adapted readings. So instead of just memorizing a lot of grammar and never actually reading a story, which is how many Greek textbooks are designed, this drops you down into a very simple story the very first lesson. And then I explain all the grammar. You get the quick sheets, which show you how to learn the endings and so forth. But once again, I have to stress that all the way along, it is interesting. 
interesting stories to read. Sounds great. Now, I... I got this text from you. It said something like Black Fry Monsai. What, right. what, what does that mean? <laughs> well, we're running our Black Friday Monday Cyber. Oh. I don't notice. The Black Fry Monsai yeah. special whereby you can enroll in uh, the Moss Method, Module 1 or 2, with a 15% discount off the sticker price. And this is going to start on Saturday, November 20, which is a week from today. Coming up. And we're going to run it for 10 days. So for 10 days, you can say, I want to study Greek in the... New Year, for example, I want to do it with Dr. Noe. I want to read a fun text. I want to be able to participate in the Friday office hours over Zoom with Dr. Noe. Uh, this last Friday, just uh, yesterday, actually, as it turns out, we had people from all over the world coming together to study Greek. We looked at a little New Testament. We looked at some Xenophon. It was, uh, it was a great time. So go to mossmethod.com and then come along with us to learn some Greek. This episode is also brought to you by Racial Coffee. No, what? Wait, who is that? Do I have a new co-host now, or what's going on? <laughs> no, that's that. That would be my daughter. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's. She, you haven't noticed her in the vomitorium today. I just, I just noticed just now. Well, yeah. why don't you ask her what she thinks about Racial Coffee? Uh, uh, Sophie, what do you what do you think about Ratio? Uh, I think it's very good. Uh, you, do you drink a, a nice cup every morning? No, not no. <laughs> every morning. I have tried it before. It's but you've good. you've seen the beautiful machine your your dad has there on the counter, right? Oh yes, it's very nice. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Sits right there at the end of the counter. Yeah. I don't have to tell her to clean it, right? That's not her job. No, of course not. And let's, let's be honest, the ratio hardly needs any cleaning. No, it's a, it is, it's, a, it's a work of art. It is. I've got the six, you've got the eight. Right. So I love my machine. It's, yes. It's sleek. It's beautiful. Can you say a few words about the process of uh, how is the coffee made? Because this is an important part of the ratio experience. Right. So you get, you get it all set up with your grounds and, and you, you fill the water tank. And you hit the button, the lights start to, to shine, mm-hmm. and it, you first you get the bloom stage. The bloom. And that's where all the nasty gases are expelled. Into the biosphere. Into the biosphere. And then there's the brew stage. Right. Yes, where the water is, is poured over the ground. It's really hot water. Very hot. Zero to 200 degrees Fahrenheit in 20 seconds, yes. something like that. Very impressive. Powerful machine. And then... When it, on my machine, the lights blink three right. times, it's ready to go. Yes, so the little LED that tracks you from bloom to brew to ready. <laughs> That's right? right. It's a bloom with a brew. It is a bloom with a brew. So you don't need to go and get some mass brew-deuced coffee no. at, at some banery, beagly, barnery, no. something. There's no point to do It that. doesn't taste good. No. And you don't need to buy one of those $20 uh, Dak and Blecker, uh, something like that. The scorch that. patters. Yes, yeah. exactly, with the brackish tang and so forth. Terrible. It's not going to make good coffee. No. Now, what about the price, Jeff? It's not cheap, It right? is not cheap, yeah, right. We call it attainable. But do you think it's a good value? I think it's a very good value. Okay. I, mean, I, I know my machine is going to be there in my kitchen for a very long time. Right. Right. It might be passed down to my children right. and their children yes. as an heirloom. Right? So if you want to participate in the Ratio Coffee experience, dear listener, please go to... RatioCoffee.com. Correct. R-A-T-I-O Coffee.com. Uh, Mark Helweg has said that the response to this coupon has been overwhelming. Yes. We are so grateful to all of you who are supporting this program and scoring some great coffee. There's a coffee... A coffee coupon code, there right? There is. A A-N-C-O. A-N-C-O. Very there you simple. have it. Check yep. it out. All right, Dave. So as we get back into this, um, you leave undergrad. Right. Now you're off to grad school. Right yes. away. Did you go to grad school right after undergrad? I had one semester off because okay. I actually finished in the middle of the year. That's right. That's right. And I had all of these uh, very noble intentions of keeping up my Latin and Greek and even expanding on it before I go to grad school. Did, did, so you didn't? Did you go into like another intense period of independent study? Like no, you do, no. no. <laughs> I barely touched the Greek and Latin for six or seven months, frankly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're done with undergrad. I mean, you're, you're kind of, everybody's a little bit burned out. Well, sure, sure. But I was also uh, terrified of going to grad school and being embarrassed for the ignoramus I felt I was at the time. I see, I see. Because when I entered the University of Iowa in the fall of 95, I had done about eight or nine semesters of Greek, so a large amount of Greek. Yep. But I had only done two and a half semesters of Latin. Okay. Uh, I was not very um, accomplished as a Latinist at all. And when you went, were you thinking, well, I've had more Greek, so I'm going to kind of follow a, a kind of a Hellenist path? Or, no. No? No, I just got dropped down in the classes that were assigned to be, <laughs> uh, assigned to me by my advisor. Yeah. yeah a wonderful fellow. So. Okay. So how, so how did that go? I mean, how was it, right. how was it different? It was how was brutal. it similar? It was, it was brutal? grueling. Okay. I'm sure you had a similar thing. I had mm-hmm. the Latin uh, rapid readings course oh. at, at the time. So uh, Professor Rob Ketterer was teaching uh, rapid readings in Latin. It meant five days per week. And uh, we were supposed to read something like, uh, I don't know, 150 pages of Latin each night. Wow. Starting with, you know, the pre 
archaic inscriptions, the Lapis Niger and so forth, and stretching all the way down in the second semester to um, Augustine of Hippo, right? Yeah. So the whole thing, and you got to read tons of this material. So the very first night, you know, I stayed up all night, literally, my first all-nighter, to try to get some, it was either Terence or Plautus, something like that. Yeah. I didn't make hardly a dent. It was just, I was going so slowly. And I, you know, showed up the next day, dreary, bleary-eyed, and what am I doing? Yeah. And uh, the professor, uh, Ketterer, he says, uh, you know, why do you look like, uh, you know, you're about to die or something? I said, well, because I stayed up all night to get all this red. And he said, well, you don't have to do that. <laughs> and he said, what was I supposed to do? Right. I, yeah. I don't assign 200 pages expecting you to finish them all. <laughs> But I think that's pretty standard for grad school, right? Yeah. I mean, that must have been similar to your experience. Yeah, I, I remember a similar uh, kind of thing. It was my first my first course was an Iliad course, so in uh, uh, Greek, um, of course, and it was the same kind of thing. Just hundreds of lines right. per night, right? And uh, you were I, our, my professor expected us to be right. um, not only to have digested all of that, but to be able to, he could pick out a word and you could right. explain its gender, number, and case and right. its use. And Yeah, you couldn't even do 400 lines of the Georgics. No, I, 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 <laughs> exactly right. So yeah, it, it, was a, it was a trial by fire. Right, but yep. it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. I read Plautus, I read Terence, Livy, Tacitus, Cicero, the whole corpus. Yeah. And I've always felt like I'm just getting a little bit of a sample of one author and then on to the next one. Yeah. Now that was quite frustrating. And I think it was maybe five or six years of my time as a Latin student before I actually finished all of one work of one author. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. The whole corpus of Catullus, I think, was maybe the first thing. Mm. And that's only, what, 116 poems, right. if I'm remembering? Uh, the second work was I read all of the first Catalinarian, and then all of the second, and then all of the third, and so forth. Uh, but it wasn't until a couple of years after grad school that I finished the whole of the Aeneid. And, oh, wow. Uh, that was a, a big deal for me. That you is, know? yeah. Um, so I started to you know, expand my knowledge, but I also got to teach at the same time. And I'm still teaching very much the grammar translation method. Learn a rule, apply a rule. Learn a rule, apply a rule. Yes. Move on. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so, so where, where comes the flip where right. you, uh, you kind of said, well, spoken Latin might be the, the better way to go. Right. Well, it happened as I was uh, starting to leave grad school and uh, to take my first job. So I got to read the confessions uh, with someone in the religion department at Iowa. And I was able to read the whole thing in Latin in one semester, which was a lot of Latin for me. And that was the first time that I had, um, maybe it isn't for some people, but for me, that was a lot of Latin uh, to consume and go through, you know, that entire work. And I was uh, also the TA uh, for this this fine uh, scholar, this woman, I can't remember her name. Um, and we used the Knudsvig text, which uh, is published by the University of Michigan, it has a purple cover. Yeah, I know. It's it. not one of the more popular Latin textbooks. And on the whole... I didn't enjoy it a lot, but one thing I learned from it, which was essential, was to try to think about the sentences as communication and not as puzzles. Ah. Right? So each Latin sentence I learned has three core elements. I can't remember if it's called in that book the kernel or some some metaphor, but each Latin sentence has three core elements. And if you've studied Latin with me before, you know that I, I talk about this on and on. It's got the, you know, the kernel, which is the subject and the verb, you know, something like dequint, they say. Then it has, where the, you know, the subject's implicit in the verb. Then it has either adverbial modification, right, lente dequint, they speak slowly. Or it's got adjectival modification, right? Uh, weary, the men, right, a weary bony, good men speak slowly. Weary uh, bony, lente dequint, something like mm-hmm. that. So that threefold identification, right? The core or the kernel of the sentence, adverbial modification, adjectival modification. I've used that a thousand times Okay. Uh, since that time. I learned that from that book and began to think about Latin as a means of communication, not as a sophisticated puzzle for me to solve. Now, this, the professor that you did this with, um, uh, were you getting that from her as well? Or was it just this, the book was kind of teaching you. Well, the book was teaching me, yeah. honestly. So the, she was a good professor. I, I really am appreciative of her work. But she was not, you, you're no. not using a spoken method. No, no, okay. no, not okay. at all. Okay. Not at all. But I was beginning to to think, okay, Latin is a means of communication. Mm-hmm. It's not just a puzzle. Even though I like solving puzzles, right? Yeah. Enigmata. And that was, uh, that was good. So then I began teaching. And then in 2005, right? So in 2005, now I have uh, three children of my own. And I wanted to teach them Latin, you know, ex pueritia, right? Or ex uh, ab infantia from the very earliest stages, right? And so I have to think, well, you know, I can't just drop them onto Cicero 
I got to teach them a lot of quotidian vocabulary right. so that they can have an experience that this is an actual language. So I start studying. I start learning the word for fork, fuskinula, and spoon, cochlear, and, uh, you know, nose and ears and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I get to go to the Conventiculum Lexingtoniense uh, in 2005 with Terence Tunberg, and uh, I met uh, David Morgan, Beatae Memoriae, and some other really fine spoken Latinists. And now I have a model or a goal. That particular uh, conference, did you just kind of stumble on that, or you were thinking, okay, there's people out there doing right. spoken Latin, uh, you were aspiring to that. Right. Um, like when you're putting together this vocabulary for your kids, right. had you like lo- looked and said, oh, there are people doing spoken yes. Latin. Yes. Okay, you had done I okay. started to search. I started to realize, uh, well, you know, when you, when you start out learning a language, you know nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Then you make it past the first hurdle, and you think, yeah, I'm getting pretty good at this. In fact, now I'm better than, you know, anyone who doesn't know it. <laughs> it's just right. small. But then the more you learn, the more you realize, wow, my knowledge is really deficient. Yes. And so there was a stage there, you know, 2003, 2005, when I started to realize, yeah, I may be the expert in any given classroom, and and I may be the expert uh, compared to a few other persons, but in terms of the language, do I really know it? Yeah. Resounding no. Yeah, right, right. And so I just have to, I have to find better teachers. Right. So that's been my um, trajectory ever since. I want to find people who know it much better than I do. So I can learn. Right. Have you heard that, that famous uh, anecdote about Villamovitz, the great uh, you know, German scholar in the 19th century, where he, somebody asked him about his knowledge of Greek, right. and he said something like that, you know, which is, with all my learning and knowledge and, and reading, he says, I probably have the knowledge of ancient Greek of a, of a six-year-old schoolboy. Yeah, yeah. so, is it one of those things like, like well, why even bother? Right. right? Well, <laughs> uh, because it's just inherently, it's just thrilling to do. Yes. It's so pleasing. And you get access to all these great minds of the past, exactly, you know, right. uh, unfiltered, unadulterated, directly. But that can be a really crushing realization, you know. And I've had several of those throughout my time as a student of Latin. Crushing realizations? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, I, I had very carefully uh, tried to teach my children, you know, the names of different vegetables and so mm-hmm. forth. And um, so you got kai pai, onions, allium, garlic, apium, celery. Did you throw arugula in there? No arugula. <laughs> And then the word for peas, right? Peas. Because you're always trying to get your kids to eat peas. Yes. And uh, after many years of studying and teaching them all this stuff, turns out I had been using the form wrong. It only occurs in the plural, pisa. Pisa. It it doesn't occur in the singular. Okay. So. All right. Now, maybe it doesn't seem like a big deal. (laughs) As I'm telling you the story, you know. Did it help your children eat peas? uh, Probably not. Yeah. (laughs) But you want to teach them things that are accurate, yeah. right? And, right, right, right. Uh, and children you. are very impressionable. It's mm-hmm. that, it's in, in Platonic terms, it's the soft wax of the mind it takes impressions easily. You don't want to put the wrong thing on there because it's going to be stuck yes. practically forever. Yes, exactly. So I go to the Conventiculum in 2005. I go back in 2009, you know, and I'm, I'm still uh, learning how to speak Latin. So... Um, you and I are working on a project. We are. Right. I'm very excited about it. Yes. Yeah. It's called, uh, the working title is Fardrago, right? Mm-hmm. A hodgepodge. 2,501 uh, original Latin sentences, right? And these were the ones that you wrote for your children. That's right. Yes. 2,501, and they're just very quotidian, lots of everyday vocab. And uh, you're doing the illustrations for I this am work. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, it's right. been a while my, uh, t- the, since I've done some good cartooning. So right, this is some be fun. syndicated work. Now, so, how, how long did that take you to write 2,500 plus Latin sentences? Original Latin yeah. sentences? Well, uh, it, was a, it was many, many years, yeah. but I would typically work on them at off times. I would try to you, come up with a fresh set whenever I you know, put to my children these exercises. And you just kind of kept it, uh, a list, a database? Yes. And, yeah. yeah, I used Google Docs. Yeah. I just kept adding to it. And... Uh, of course, at the beginning, they were um, exceedingly simple and sometimes erroneous, right? Because I was learning myself. Yeah. And I'd go back and fix and correct. Uh, but I learned a whole lot in the process. I learned a tremendous amount. And uh, one of the resources that I used is this Amory book, right? The first thousand words in Latin. Right. A lot of online uh, materials as well, including now the very readily available Lexicon Morganianum, which uh, Patrick Owens keeps. And um, you can go there and you can search. It's so easy, so convenient. It's know? got that's. I think I, I've taken a glance at that. It's got a lot of uh, kind of neo Latin. Exactly. Uh, right. Right. Extensive neo Latin. You want to know how to say cowboy, 
right? Armentarius, cowboy. So maybe, maybe the rocket, it, I could find it in that He list? could have found okay. rocket, of course. Right. Arugula man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but you put all this stuff together and, you know, you write these sentences and then you know, people get to use them so that they can they can actually learn Latin. And then I just tried whenever I had the opportunity, you know, to speak Latin. And uh, I'm still not very good at it, I would say. But I, I get to know personally some of the best speakers in the world. I've been. Remember when we went to uh, Rome in 2016? I do. We went and visited the Vivarium Novum. Yes. Fascinating. We got a fantastic, friendly reception from uh, Luigi Mirali, Aloysius. Yes. And uh, all the students who are studying Latin there, right? Right. And uh, our Calvin students, they absolutely loved it. They, they were did. They riveted by it. And it wasn't just the free food. No. Right? I mean, the vast majority of our students that went with us didn't no. know any Latin, no, but they right. found it fascinating. Right. And right. we listened to a fairly long, brilliant lecture by uh, Luigi, if I'm not mistaken. I, I remember about that. About Cicero. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, this is going to get a little dry maybe for some of the kids. But no, they were by and large riveted because right. this uh, undoes, you know, the falsehood that Latin is not a language. It's it's not useful for communication. Yeah. But and the songs and the food definitely helped. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh it was quite a um, a memorable spread. Yeah. So some other persons that have been very helpful are uh, a man named Daniel Peterson who runs the website Latinitium. And uh, he's a very good spoken Latinist and uh, he has a lot of fine resources at his site. So a combination of using these resources, composing my own Latin, Uh, And then memorization, right? We were going to talk a little bit about uh, memorization. Yeah. Now, having taught spoken Latin for a a number of years and and kind of expanding your own approach. Right. I mean, what is your, uh, what do you think about kind of just the the rote memorization um, as as a teaching, as a learning tool? Well, I think rote memorization is essential. But the rote memorization of forms, mere forms, I don't think is useful. Can you explain that? Right. So the third plural, uh, pluperfect indicative active of do, is dederant. Yes. Right? Dederant. They had given, right? I don't think having a student memorize uh, what? Dederam, dederas, dederat, dederamus, dederatus, dederant. I don't think that's helpful. Okay. But I do think having them memorize one of those words in context right? Memorizing the form as part of a meaningful expression, right, is very, very useful. So if you say to the, uh, you know, the child, um, where are your shoes, right? Ubi sunt tui calcae. Um, the calcae, I think it is, the stresses on the antipenal. Where are your shoes? Then the child can respond with something, or any learner doesn't have to be a child, which cements the form of the pluperfect, you know? Mm. You can say something like, Neschio said, I don't know, but, Neschio said, parentes mei, but my parents, uh, eos mihi dederant. Right? I don't know, but my parents had given them to me. Okay, yeah. So if you contextualize it, then absolutely memorize it, but don't memorize it without context. Gotcha. Because um, it's very hard to learn things without a setting to put them in. Okay. Right, like cranks for the memories. Yes, William Perkins, <laughs> way back when. Yeah, yeah so pr- I'm proud of that one. That was yeah. a good title. That, that was, was your title. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So now, as someone who, when I last taught Latin, was still teaching, just kind of the um, here's a form, explain the form. Right. Right. So, um, how would you go about like testing a student if they're right. learning this contextually? Right. Um, what would that look like? Well, you want them as much as possible to go from English to Latin. So rather than a passive vocabulary, Mm -hmm. here's insula, tell me it means island. Uh, You can use vocabulary words still, but you put them in English and you have them produce them into Latin. Okay. Island, insula. Right. So in the Orberg book that I use so often, there is the verb pulsat, which means to strike. And early on in the book, Marcus Julian pulsat, Marcus hits Julia. But later on, we have ostium pulsat, right? I think we have Matus ostium lidii pulsat. Matus knocks on Lydia's door. Mm-hmm. So pulso, right, can mean to whop, to whop someone, uh, or it can mean to, you know, tap on a door. Right. So uh, when I go from English to Latin there, you know, if you put knock or hit, now the student has to really think, how is this expressed in Latin? Yes. Rather than... Um, blithely thinking every Latin word has one English equivalent. Exactly. Good. Which is such a hard habit to break. It is. It really is, right? Um, that whole kind of notion that language is math. We hate it, don't we? Yes. We hates it, but says it, Smeagol. It's, I think 
everybody has an element of that. You're right. When they approach language, right? You're right. What it's, does this mean? And just give me the one answer. Right. right. It's there. So I think the memorization is essential. Put as much Latin into your brain as you can mm -hmm. and keep it there and start with things you already know, right? So I have my students memorize and I have memorized uh, the symbolum apostolicum quod vocant, right? The Apostles' Creed. I memorize uh, the Lord's Prayer, Oratio Dominica. Memorize Psalm 117, Laudate Jehovah, Omnes Gentes, etc. Yes. Uh, Psalm 100, but also memorable phrases, right? Like this one from Phaedrus that I'm having my students learn now. Uh, I may have even learned this from Wheelock. I don't know. Homo doctus in se de habet. habet. Uh, the learned individual has internal wealth, hmm. right? Homo doctus in se de habet. habet. That's a very good one. Yeah. Uh, or this great phrase from uh, Cicero's Brutus. Uh, this is a good one for Latin students particular, in particular to remember, which is uh, nihil est enum uh, simul et inventum et perfectum. Nothing is at the same time discovered and made complete or made perfect. Ah, uh, right? yeah. So you got to have tremendous patience when you're learning things. Right. Because you're not going to master it immediately. Right. Poetry. Maybe not 400 lines of the Georgics. <laughs> But the first 11 lines of the Aeneid, you know, golden. Right. And uh, the first four lines of Ovid, uh, throw in a little bit of Cicero. The more Latin you can get into your head, the better. But it's, it's a good reminder that just the, the notion of, well, for any language right. that you're going to do your four semesters to get your requirement, you're not going to really, you, no. you're not going to be fluent in, in really anything. No. Right. And frankly, it's, it's not a worthwhile activity. Right, so I'm no longer in the academy anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but arguments that everyone should study a foreign language, maybe, but only if they're studying it for the right reason. Yeah, and the right reason is not to fulfill a requirement or to do it at a low level for four semesters and then say, "Yeah, I had to take Spanish in college. I right. had to take German." That's pointless. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take it because it's worthwhile in and of itself. You want to do it. Right. Otherwise. Do something better with your time. Right. I mean, my I think about my best teachers were the ones that, uh, you know, out of the classroom, I wanted to to track down and search out things that, that took me beyond what we were doing in class. Correct. Right. You know, to, to kind of create, a, uh, to instill a kind of curiosity. Right. And if you really want to learn a language, you have to have that. That's right. Or it's not going to happen. That's right. Well, Jeff, uh, I think we're kind of up against it. Are we already? Yeah. This has been we, so much fun. And we didn't even really get to the book. The, the, which we said at the beginning we were going to? Yeah, we mentioned it repeatedly, oh, but we didn't really examine it. I would just like to point out that the first section of the book is domus. Domus, the house. Domus, things in the house. We've got words like linteum, which is a towel. We've got stragulum, stragulum, a mat. Armarium, where you place your clothes, right? The vestibulum. You can probably guess what that means. The vestibulum. The vestibulum. The, the, the little room? Yeah, the, the lobby. The okay. The foyer. The foyer, yeah. So the vestibule, right? Yep. Uh, that's where you take off your clothing. Right? Gotcha. You throw off your clothing. They have these in the baths at Pompeii, the vestibulum. Got more common words like mensa, the table, scalae, the stairs. But I think we're going to have to leave the majority of this book for the next episode. So we got we got to do a part 2. It's going to be a part 2. Sounds great. How to be a Latin guru or a Sven Jolly, part 2. Uh, and then we're going to also have a lot of tips, right? A lot of tips about how to take this uh, quotidian vocabulary and incorporate it into your own daily routine. Excellent. Drawing from some of the insights of again Daniel Peterson, uh, Mike Fontaine, right, who was with us for uh, how to tell a joke. Right. In Latin, he's done some good work on this. Again, uh, you know, I just want to stress Compared to the, the, the guys and gals that know a lot about speaking Latin, I'm pretty low on the totem pole. But hopefully, together, we can share some useful things with our listeners. That sounds great. I'm actually, I'm, I'm glad that we're, that we ran out of time. You're glad we ran yeah, out of time. Yeah, because this was, this was, this was kind of funny. You know, I had to admit when you proposed this episode, I thought, oh, this is, this is great. And this is right up Dave's alley. Uh, okay. I've been I see out, how it goes. On your birthday. Yeah, but, 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 I, I but I've been out of the Latin game for a few years now, mm -hmm. so I was I was a little just concerned about like, what am I going to bring to this? Right, right. But this this has been great. It's okay. Well, you bring what you typically bring: good humor, yes, great questions. Thank you, thank you. A fine wardrobe, excellent. <laughs> thank you. That, that's an excellent birthday gift. Yeah, for me. right. Yeah. 
So we got to wrap it up, don't we? We do. Okay. So let's, um, we got some people to thank. We got some people to thank. So Mishka. Mishka Fernando. Who's our engineer. Yep. Um, who uh, takes out all the, the pops and the hisses and, and, uh, and the squarks. The squarks and, and the, the blucos. And the whips. Right. Right. Um, the scrum screes. Exactly. Makes us sound um, professional. Right. Uh, we got Scott Vinzen. And, yes. And uh, who's the other guy? Ken Tamplin. Ken Tamplin, Come of on. course. Right. The guy now. owns the internet with I, his vocal academy. Yes. For the great music that you hear yeah, throughout. how to sing like Night Ranger, how to sing like oh, Anthrax. Man. He does it all. That, man, that guy's got a voice. He does. A six, seven octave, something like that. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And he, you can learn to sing that way. Oh, you can. Yeah, check out his vocal academy. That's right. And Scott plays that blistering guitar. We need to thank Sophia Noe, right? Of course. Who helped out a little bit with today's ads. Yes. And, and it's just kind of as a general bona fortuna in the in the room, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, any anyone else we need to thank here? I think that's I think that's about it. Those are about all. Well, we need to thank the listener. <laughs> oh, those people. They're the elephants in the room, you might say. <laughs> Elefanti in conclawi Very nice. Right. Very nice. We need to thank them for listening. <laughs> of course. And in, invite them to send their comments, their criticisms, their harshly worded rebukes yep. to Jeff. At ad nauseum.com. Don't forget the V in right. there. Or to Dave at ad nauseum.com. And also, I would say, uh, encourage the, to, the listener to leave a review. Yes, we um, would like that. On your the platform of your choice. Right. Uh, that, that helps... Uh, I increase the listenership. And, right. And, uh, Share it with your friends if there's something in here, you know, yep. uh, that, that they like. Maybe they'd be interested in. You know, we want to keep the classics alive. Join us in Cursing the Darkness is Absolutely. what we would say. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. we're going to continue this in a part two. Yeah, next week. Next we got week. part two coming up. And Dave, you have our gustatory parting shot, I believe. I do. And uh, I really like this one. This is from a man that I admire greatly. Uh, his name is George Washington Carver, hmm. an American um, postbellum. A scientist, and uh, this is from his work, How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing It for Human Consumption. That's awesome. Now, the brilliance of this quote, just to set it up, is this is one of those things you would think, you don't really need to say this, right? Yeah, yeah. But the, the plain fact is, you do. <laughs> so he says, note, always remove the brown hull from the peanuts, even though the recipe does not say so. <laughs> Take it from George. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.